I also have a, a new slide deck, which I may or may not have, have posted thus far, but which I will. Okay, so you folks may recall um, in our previous lecture, artifacts of which remain on the board here, um, we had uh, covered some of the basic uh, description uh, of a system, a dynamical system, uh, mathematically. And um, because it proved to be a convenient framework, proves to be a convenient framework, we were using um, differential equations, ordinary differential equations, and particularly systems of ordinary differential equations, you know, where there's each one is, is um, uh, uh, a single uh, first order differential equation, but they come in sets and, and series that are coupled in general. And we use that to talk about the structural perspective. And I'm just going to remind you of it, and we're going to come back to this issue of these four perspectives. Two structural perspectives, where we're going to focus on stock and flow diagrams, the ODEs, and then two behavioral perspectives, behavior over time and state space. Um, so you may remember that um, I, I had argued uh, from this floor that uh, we could characterize a, a dynamical system in terms of a state a set of state variables or a vector of state variables in this case vector it's it's ordered where it's not just a grouping of them but a, an ordered grouping here um, and we could characterize the rate of change of a given state variable um, uh, with respect to time um, uh, in terms of some function of state and in fact it's the fact that on the right hand side here we see a function of state that the behavior of the system depends on state that distinguishes this as a dynamic system for example you might have a stochastic system which has behavior over time but that behavior consists just of draws from random variables in a way that that is uh, independent and identically distributed over time uh, and and that's um, that's something that doesn't require a dynamical systems to uh, perspective. A dynamical system is distinguished by the fact that its behavior depends on some underlying state. It's evolving according to some underlying <coughs> state. We use different terms for it, but it's to be distinguished from some systems where their behavior does not depend on an underlying state. It, it may be behavior over time, but it's in a way that that is not dependent on some typically latent underlying state. So we have this function of the, the state that dictates at any one time the rate of change of the state, ds, dt, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I, I noted that in general, well, this function, for this to kind of match up uh, dimensionally, this function needs to be a vector-based function in general because S is a vector of state variables, and therefore ds dt is a vector of derivatives of those state variables, dx dt, dy dt, dz dt, et cetera. And of course, there needs to be some value for that vector. For each of the elements of the vector, there needs to be some value determined by f, right? So f is a vector-valued function. It takes a vector in as an input, and it puts a vector out as an, as an output, right? Um, so it, it, its result is a vector as well. Um, and um, in general, this dictates the governing equations for the system and how those governing equations depend on s. Note here that I haven't ruled out that f might also have a component that doesn't depend on s. What are some components that might not depend on s? Thinking back to models you've been involved with, You've been involved with lots of models that fit neatly into this characterization. But, but describe for me, as, uh, if you could, some um, forms where uh, you've, it's dependent on some things that are not just S. <coughs> What's the most obvious case? It might depend on constants, right? It might depend, like maybe you have a constant immigration rate, right, for your system. And, and so there might be constant terms over here computed by f, right? Um, that, that's not ruled out. Similarly, there might be exogenous factors as a function of time ruled out. And so often we write f of s comma t, 
where t is the time. So we actually tell it what time it is, and it tells us, oh, okay, the weather for that day is, you know, this temperature, this rainfall, this humidity, um, this wind speed, etc., and use that in f. Um, for brevity, I haven't put that in, but commonly you might write this as s comma t when it can be a non, when it can be a time varying function. Okay, uh, uh, but if we leave it out, we talk often about time invariant functions. I don't mean to, <coughs> to uh, whoa, okay, to, <laughs> to characterize it. Uh, in too limited a way here. So I, I've written this out um, here in, in some examples. Um, okay, uh, great. Um, now, last time, um, I had uh, talked some about linearity and nonlinearity, which we're going to come back to uh, today. But I had set us up to talk about that in a particular cogent way by talking about <laughs> characterizing the system this is just the same equations as before, ds dt equals f of s, where f is a vector value function. And for simplicity, I, I noted that f of s, look, I mean, there's got to be, f is a vector valued function, returns a vector as, element, as, as, a, as a return value, um, and uh, that vector has to be the same length as s, right? And the same length by extension as ds dt. So there needs to be an element to that vector for x, for y, dot, 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 for z, right? F needs to determine a value. And, and let's be very concrete about it. I mean, F determines a specific scalar value, a number, as it were, for, for the x component. So F of s, whatever it returns, this vector value function of state, it's got to have a particular number for x that represents the rate of change of x, right? It has to have a specific number for y that represents the rate of change of y. It has to have a specific number for z that represents the, change, the rate of change of z. And so we can represent this vector-valued function of state as a vector of scalar um, functions of state, one for each of those elements. Does that make sense? Mm. Okay, um, uh, so, so here we have f of s represents a vector of scalars, and, um, and we're just characterizing that in this, in this vector. Okay. Um, so f sub x of s here, I just want to be very clear, because this notation is sometimes used to indicate a derivative by itself. It's not. This is the x component of f. This vector valued function of state has a particular value in it computed for s for the x component of this vector, right? So the x component of a vector for a given value of state is going to be some number. And that's what f sub x computes, right? Right? That's what f sub x of s is. It's what the value of x is and the rate of change of x per unit time, dx dt is going to be given by f sub x of, of x. And notice very importantly, and this is a key point, notice very importantly, this is a function of state. It's not just a function of x, because in general, the rate of change of x will depend not just on the value of x, but the value of y and z, and any other state variables, and vice versa, right? That's why these are coupled systems. So the rate of change of hairs the, the size of the population of hairs, how quickly that's going up or down, or whether it's flat, will depend not just on the number of hairs, but the number of links, right? Right? Um, that, that hunt them. And so, in general, the rate of change of x, say hairs, is going to be a function not just of x, but of x and y and z and, and other components of the system, right? These are coupled systems, and that's going to have a world of difference. In terms of the data science, uh, it's kind of a world of difference in terms of our of our understanding of state space, etc. Um, the fact that they're coupled means they're, they're actually a lot lower dimensional than we think. And information about one thing tells us information about the others. Um, our ability to predict the system is enhanced because of it. Um, our ability to represent the system can be enhanced, etc. Okay, so I argued last time 
that we could, for a general system of this sort, we could express it in a linearized way, much as it kind of using the same basic principles by which we take a Taylor series expansion of a, of a function. So if we want to consider the rate of change of, of, of s um, um, uh, as a state variable at some particular point, and, oh man, I, I got to go back and, and, and make this clear, at some particular point, which I, <laughs> I also call it s, um, but at some particular point, um, uh, we could consider its rate of change of a nearby point, s uh, question mark, and, um, and, and then add to it some term that reflected the difference between s and s question mark, um, and how much uh, f is changing with respect to each of its components um, in each direction that s is separated from s, um, from s question mark plus some high order terms. And I made the analogy here to this on, in a one dimensional way with a line, right? Um, and I showed it with, with the line, but it might be, you know, a curve that's varying nonlinearly, but any one time we could zoom in on it and see something that's basically a line if we look at a small enough gap between S and S question mark. And I argued, look, um, if we're around S question mark, we can reason about the rate of change at S question mark and sort of project it out to get um, what the likely value is, a pro, uh, to, to get what the likely value is for f. Um, but in this case, we have higher order terms as well that give us, give us um, uh, other ways of bending in successively sort of more contorted ways. Um, and those higher order terms are nonlinear, which is very important. Okay? They involve not just s minus uh, s, s question mark, which has one component for x, one component y, one component z. They will have components, for example, the next term up will have components for x squared, the change in x squared, the change in y squared, the change in z squared, change in y, quantity squared, change in z, quantity squared, change in x, quantity squared, but also what? They would have not just x, uh, change in x squared, change in y squared, change in z squared, but x, y, change in x times the change in y, change in x times the change in z, these sort of cross terms, okay? These are higher order terms. Um, and I haven't written them out, they're commonly abbreviated HOT, higher order terms. And I noted this matrix, which, which basically examines, um, it's the analog for this slope in one dimension. It says how much does f, the function f vary as we go in a certain direction here, x, y, z, with, and doing that for a specific component of f, like f, the x component of f. Remember, f sub x is um, the function that gives the rate of change of x given the current state, right? Um, so f sub x, so we consider here the f sub x dt, dx, but it's a partial derivative. So it's partial f sub x, partial x, okay? So it's how much is f sub x changing when we go in the, how quickly is it rising as we go in the x direction, in the y direction, in the z direction. And we noted um, that, that um, you know, if, if it's changing, f sub x is changing really quickly when we go in the x direction, but very slowly when we go in the y direction, and slowly when we go in the, in the z direction, we could consider how much does it change overall by taking successive multiplications of say partial f sub x partial x by the change in x par plus partial f sub x with respect to the change in y times what? The change in yes. and y. Um, partial uh, f, so if we consider the, the rate of change of f sub x with respect to z, and we multiply it by the change in z, it'll give us, and we add these up, it'll give us the rate of change of x of x overall, the, the so-called total derivative. And that's what you see on this slide here, right? And I argued that stepping out of dynamical systems, stepping out of the issue of, model, of dynamic modeling more generally, 
Um, uh, this actually presents us with one way to think about matrices, and we're going to be emphasizing this point again, different views of understanding matrices as operators. Here, we're taking dot products of a, as it were, a vector of weights. We can think of it as kind of like a, a, a vector of, of weights, delta x, delta y, delta z. That's what's represented by this S minus X question mark. The X component I call delta X, right? And the, the Y component I call delta Y. We're taking those as kind of weights to weight each successive elements of the rows here. And at a, at a quantitative level, we're taking the dot product of this vector of these weights with the vector of each of these elements, okay? So we're, we're kind of take a weighted sum of partial f sub x, partial x, and partial f sub x, and partial y, and partial f sub x, and partial z, and it's a weighted sum of those things where the weights are given by delta x, delta y, delta z, as given by this change, whoa, in, in s. So that was one view of matrices in this dot product way, or sort of weighted sums of the elements of each row, and that will give us, in this case, the total derivatives, f sub x um, with respect to this, um, uh, the change in f sub x with respect to this change in uh, s minus uh, x question mark. Okay, so this, this gave us sort of this perspective on, on matrices. And we called this matrix the what? Who remembers? Jacobian. It's the Jacobian matrix, okay? Um, uh, commemorating the great mathematician Jacobi. Okay. Um, now, um, okay, so um, we're going to be coming and spending a, a significant amount of time around this issue of linearizing around um, uh, dot products. This is just sort of what I was, uh, was um, uh, characterizing with those elements, and this is the, the, um, the one-dimensional analogy, and this is the total derivatives here uh, up on the board memorialized um, for you in slides so I can erase it. Now, I'm going to be talking in a central way today about linearity, okay? And we're going to be looking at linear functions. So in general, we call a function linear, as we said up there on the board, if two properties of that function f hold. I'm stepping out of dynamical systems for a moment, just talk about functions of one argument, returning, so of a scalar, returning a scalar um, for the moment. Um, uh, talk about linearity for them, and then we'll apply it to dynamical systems. So if we have a function um, of a single argument, um, it, we consider this a linear function if f of a plus b is equal to f of a plus f of b. Okay? Um, and, uh, but it also has to, to match uh, this criteria here, f of alpha times x is equal to alpha times f of x. Okay? It's, 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 it's linear. And these are going to have big implications for us, but I want to uh, draw, draw an equation. If we, if we consider this now with respect to this function of vectors, we could use the same exact notion. If we have a vector-based function of vectors, so it takes in a vector as an argument, and puts out a vector as a return uh, quantity, um, we call it linear if f of s plus a is uh, sorry, s of a plus s of b, two vectors, equals f of s of a plus s of f of s of b, okay? And f of alpha times s equals alpha times f of s. So what is this telling us? Well, it's saying, look, if we have, if we have a combination of two states, like if we have a state which has, let's consider s sub a, a state where we have no infectives, or recoveds, but we have all susceptibles, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's suppose S sub B is a state where we have no susceptibles, but we have, so zero susceptibles, but we have infectives and no recoveds, right? What this is telling us is that for a linear system, F of the combination of those, if we sort of consider a state where we have, we have susceptibles and infectives, right, um, uh, together, uh, 
and 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 say no recoveries. Um, that that is equal to f considering just the infectives uh, uh, plus one considering f and just the the uh, susceptibles. Um, I forgot what I said about recovered, so we could throw that in there or consider one with just uh, susceptibles and infectives. So the idea here is, look, for a linear system, it, it needs to be the case that if you consider a superposition of states where we have both of those, we have recovered and infectives together, that um, the, the behavior of the system with respect to that is, needs to be the same as the behavior of the system with just susceptibles alone, no infectives, and just infectives alone, no susceptibles. I'm highlighting this because it, it, it probably will stand in contrast to how you think many familiar systems, like with infectious disease transmission, would, would behave, right? If, if you have an infectious disease, um, uh, and we characterize it using, uh, um, we characterize its transmission, using a function f, the function f gives the rate of change of the state given the current state. Um, is this true? No, it's not, right? Because if we have no infectives in all susceptibles, so that's f of s sub a, and if we separately have, uh, so if we have all infectives, no susceptibles, and if we have uh, all susceptibles and no infectives, um, each of those, will the disease be transmitted? No, right? Because it takes two to tango, right? It, it takes, there needs to be an infective and a susceptible for it to be transmitted. But if we consider both together, the behavior is very different, right? So a linear system is a very strong assumption here that you can take, if you have a, a state that is composed of many pieces and we consider the response of the system um, to that state as a whole, it's exactly equal to the, res to the sum of the response of the system with respect to each of those pieces, right? There's sort of this, this um, uh, interchange. Uh, some of you might recognize this as very closely related to the notion of a homomorphism, that we can, you know, we have f of a plus, and we turn that uh, into a plus of s, right? We, we, we sort of switch the order in which they're doing, and, and with a linear system, that's fine. Okay, now... Here's, a, here's a, another property that a linear system must hold of vectors. F of s times a vector of alpha, f of alpha times some vector s must equal alpha times f of s, okay? Um, and what this is saying, saying is, for example, if we have, if we have um, uh, 100 infectives or 200 infectives, the response of the system to um, say uh, 200 infectives must be twice the response of the system to 100 infectives, right? Um, S here is a system with 100 infectives. And now we're considering doubling the, that state. So now we have 200 infectives. Um, the response of the system to those 200 infectives, F of alpha S must be two times the response with respect to them. To 100, right? So these are very strong conditions. Now, when we, but, but very useful systems exist, as we'll soon see. So I had argued before that we, with this sort of thinking about expressing a system uh, ex, uh, in terms of these successive elements, just like a Taylor expansion, here we have um, S dot equals, you know, these terms on the right. And I noted the higher order terms of both nonlinear terms. Well, for a linear function, let's reason through this. Higher order terms are zero, okay? And the reason is, um, so a couple simplifications occur with linear systems that, are, that allow us to represent these systems with great ease and great insight. For a linear function, the higher order terms are zero because the second derivatives are all, all zero. When we have a um, uh, a linear system. Um, we have a, a system which um, has only linear terms on the right. We're dealing with terms that are constants or ter terms that are, um, are uh, involved at the state itself, S. It turns out these higher order terms will disappear. Um, so for example, if we have F of, well here, up here, um, F of, let's say, um, 
uh, 2x. Uh, so if our function of x is uh, 2x, the first derivative of this with respect to x will be what? 2. The second derivative will be 0. And that is true in general of, of uh, linear systems. Okay. Um, uh, I could go on about it, and um, I'd be glad to discuss that separately. I don't want to um, go formally prove that quite yet. Um, but more than that, for a linear system, we know f of alpha s equals alpha f of s for any alpha. That was that property right here, right? The second property. Um, so by picking alpha equals zero, we can demonstrate we can, this is true for any alpha. So by let's consider alpha equals zero as a as a convenient one for insight. We could find that f of alpha s equals well. We just write f of alpha s as if if. Alpha is zero, we write f of zero times s, right? Alpha is zero. So we're considering, for considering f of alpha s here, we're considering f of zero times s, which is just f of zero. So this is, how would the system behave with a zero state? A state with nothing, you know, zero elements for x, for y, for z, etc. That has to equal, by, by the terms of this equality, Alpha times f of s, okay, um, for any s, okay. Um, let's consider um, uh, alpha times f of s. Well, alpha is zero, so that's equal to f of s. So what that's telling us is that that uh, zero times any vector f of s is equal to zero. So here, what we have is f, the response of the system to a zero vector is just zero response. It, a, a linear system cannot have any rate of change with respect to a vector that starts zero. <laughs> if, if you give it a zero vector, it gives you back a zero rate of change across all the elements. That's what this f of zero is. That's for a zero current state. So we have no susceptibles, we have no infectives, we have no recoveries. Um, or for a different system, we have no Babies, no children, no adults, you know, for example, um, the rate of change of that system has to be zero, right? There's no change. Okay, so that's for linear system, we know that. And, um, and, and so these promise us ability to simplify it if we're clever. And specifically, this top thing was an expansion around this point F, some arbitrary point F sub, or F, F um, super question mark, right? S question mark. That was an arbitrary point, point we chose to expand the system around it by considering successive elements, these linear terms, etc. Well, with a linear system, the higher order terms, the HOTs, disappear. So we have F, um, F of S question mark plus this um, Jacobian times, times that. And here, as a convenience, we can choose f s question mark as zero, and so then we get f of zero plus. So we're we're just we could this is true for any arbitrary point s question mark. So we're going to pick s question mark equals zero, and if we just plug it into this top equation, we just get um, th this this state equations, which are s dot equals f of s. Those turn into um, by this expansion at the top, f of zero plus the Jacobian times s minus zero. I'm just plugging it into that second term. S minus s question mark turns into s minus zero. And uh, that's all the higher order terms were, were gone, we know from this first point here. So, so basically this turns into, well, we know f of zero is zero, right? So this turns into the Jacobian times s minus zero, which of course is just s. Right? So a, a, a linear system can be represented as S dot equals some matrix times S. There's no need to worry about this term, you know, that, that we have to deal with at any given point that represents how fast the system is changing at that point. We can just reason how fast it's changing around, you know, zero, and uh, by doing so, we can represent it in a particularly, particularly easy form, this form here, which is s dot equals a s. And because writing 
arrows takes a while and because it's not conventional to really stick at that, I'll just write it x dot equals ax. And forgive me, but I'll use x to indicate the underlying state of the system here, okay? Okay, um, so this just came out of this. This is a matrix of constants for a linear system. For a linear system, f sub x is some linear function, so it evolves, say, um, uh, x's and y's and z's and maybe some constants. And if we take its derivative, it'll either be 0 or it'll involve some other constant. Um, constant. We take its derivative of x or x or y, etc. So this is just a matrix of constants. It's A for a linear system. For a linear system, this is a matrix of constants. OK. Um, now, I need to tell you, and this is a, a comment I made, I think, with respect to Lavi's question. There was a question from Lavi that was a good question, as normal, the other day. And I made some reference to the fact that um, sometimes things that, aren't, uh, that initially appear nonlinear can be easily transformed, that is, in a linear way, into a, a linear system. So, so for many linear systems, we phrase them initially like this, OK? Um, uh, x dot equals b plus a, a of x, where b is some constant vector, OK? Um, and I, I want to give you an example to make this concrete. So we're going to switch over to my examples here. Um, we'll go through this, um, uh, these first two examples, and we'll see this. The first involves, ladies and gentlemen, it involves this system, which is called example 11A, OK? Um, and I'm going to open it in Vensim here, um, so you can see it in Vensim. And we're going to walk through it. And we will see this B come up um, when we extend it to include some other factors, such as, um, uh, such as um, immigration. So here's our first system, OK? We have some x, say this is a population size of bacteria, and um, there's the mean time the bacteria spend in x and they die after some time, okay? And I should be criticized for allowing the, the cases to differ for x, okay? And that should be mean time in, in uh, capital X. Okay, so here we have a linear system. This is described, as you know, in the first order of delay, so this should be very familiar to people. Um, and we could write it, of course, in differential equation form as dx dt equals, and suppose the mean time in this state is 2. This formula is what? Remember, I argued before to be dimensionally consistent. If we have a mean time in x of 2, what does this formula for death of x have to be? It says standard first order delay. What does this formula have to be? X times the mean time or divided? Divided. It has to be because this is a time and a flow has to have units, the units of the stock divided by time. So this is a time, but you have to have that. We can't have times. That would be saying the flow has rates of units of like, you know, bacteria time, um, uh, you know, like cumulative bacteria days that they have lived or something like that. And that's, that's not compatible with this being a flow from it, okay? So, so we know it, it has to have that. Um, and if we go back to this equation, here we go. So that's represented here with this. I, I've taken the liberty of saying minus 0.5 times x because that's the same as x minus x of t divided by 2, where 2 is the mean time, right? Um, uh, just to make it consistent and deal with less sort of fancy formatting, of, I've done that. Um, forgive me. Um, OK, so um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here we have uh, a simple system. The minus reflects the fact that what? It's an outflow, yeah. In, in, so if we, the rate of change um, as x of t rises, um, the, the number of people flowing out goes up, and they're flowing out, and therefore decreasing x, right? OK, so here's its 
Here's one perspective, the stock, whoa, whoa, sorry. Here's one perspective, the stock and flow perspective, right? Um, here we have these feedback loops shown visually. Here we have this high level sort of characterization um, at a visual level of what's going on that will be increasingly important when we get multiple stocks. Um, we go to the, we go to this form, differential equations, and we can go solve this in either one. Of course, we could solve it here and you know, do a synthesis and happily see this decrease. We can also go you know, plot it out and we see this familiar friend. I hope it's your friend. It should be your friend. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, it started at 400 and uh, at first, given the fact the stock is very large, there's a very rapid rate of flow out and so it's decreasing very quickly. And then as the stock decreases, there's fewer people in it and therefore the people, the rate at which people are coming up per unit time, number of people per unit time is going down. So it, the rate of change, the rate of decrease of it um, grows closer to zero. In other words, it's, it's, it's changing, it's dropping less quickly. And so over time, you see it dropping less and less quickly, reflecting the fact that there are fewer and fewer bacteria, I should say bacteria, not people, who are, who are still in X, right? And as X approaches zero, it's the number of bacteria dying per unit time is very small indeed. Uh, even though the mean time in that stock is the same, even though the chance per unit time each bacteria will die is the same, um, there's just fewer bacteria remaining. And so the number of bacteria per unit time that die um, becomes uh, very small, right? Familiar? Okay, and we see that created here from this stock and flow model in here within Maple, right? Using ODE plot. Now we could take the Jacobian and the Jacobian here is particularly trivial. I mean, all we have is one state equation, it's, it, but it's a useful, it's always useful to go back to these very simple cases to think things through. The Jacobian of, of a matrix consisting of a single element here, um, which is, um, you know, the uh, partial F sub X, partial X um, here, uh, F sub X, the, the rate of change of this function on the right hand side here with respect to, uh, to, to X, uh, F sub X is just minus 0.5 times X. And if we take uh, the derivative of that with respect to X, guess what we get? We get minus 0.5. That's the eigenvalue associated with it, okay? This is actually, um, it's, it's going to be the eigenvalue associated with it as well. If we take the eigenvalues of this Jacobian matrix, that's gonna tell us kind of the characteristic rate of change in terms of this natural coordinate system for the, for the, the matrix. That's where we're going. But this is telling us basically very directly, the system is changing according to this, uh, this sort of um, natural first order decay with a decay rate of minus 0.5, okay? Um, and uh, it turns out the eigenvectors, the coordinate system here is just x, so there's, there's nothing fancy. We'll, we'll come to that and we'll go through the symmetry transform later. Now this is the fourth perspective though here. So we, we had two perspectives, we had um, structurally, we had one in system dynamics, we had one over here in differential equations. Here we go. Then we had two, two dynamic perspectives, one here over time, which we also did here, and one, ladies and gentlemen, that, uh, that involves state space. And here's our first little state space portrait of it. So state space here is particularly simplistic because it only involves one variable, x of t, right? That's the complete state of the system, x, right? And so, so we, to show its trajectory in state space, Maple sticks on another line that's time, okay? Which is, kind of confuses maybe to you what the notion of state space is. But we're gonna come back to that um, when, very quickly with two variables, okay? Uh, a system with two variables, x and y. Okay, but first I want to talk about this case with, 
with a system that's nominally nonlinear. Okay, that's this one here. We're going to have the same system. Um, this is going to be B here. And uh, example B, okay, zero B. Okay, and I'm gonna load this in to Vensim. So here we go. Uh, do I wanna leave it? Yeah, yeah, here we go. There we go. Um, okay, so here we're going to have something different. What's different in this? In this? We have an inflow. And this inflow is going to be constant here, okay? It's gonna be 100. 100 bacteria coming in to this system per unit time, okay? We still have the same outflow, the same mean time. Okay, so how does that, how does that change things? Well, at the most immediate seeming level, um, it's, it's gonna seem to change things in important ways. Um, uh, so dynamically, it'll be expected to change things, but even in terms of sort of thinking about the system structurally, it seems to lead to different behavior. And let's go, let's go see what the behavior is first, both in state space and in, and in t over time. And then let's talk about um, its, uh, its uh, structural implications, this issue of, of nonlinearity. So here's its behavior over time. So its behavior over time, if we run this, whether in running the ODEs here, kind of this most compressed representation of it, or we run the, this in synthesis, we'll see something that should look fairly familiar. Right? Does that, does that look familiar for something we saw a few minutes ago? What does that look like? What does that, if you, if you ignore this axis on the right, what does that look kind of like? Well, it, it looks like what we saw for the last one, right? Okay, so take a look at this. Uh, it's dropping quickly and then slowly, and even the rate of change here will be the same as for the last one. So here we go. We're gonna go back to the first one here, and we're gonna view it and, and we'll go put it up here and it, it looked basically the same. It's the same rate of change, minus 0.5. It's got that same natural sort of um, natural dynamics, natural decay with the same rate. The only thing that differs is this axis on the, the left and the, and the quantities involved. So take a look at this, right? Um, and then take a look at it for B, for, for the, the variant with immigration coming in. And here we go, we're gonna run it, yeah, and we're gonna graph it. Well, okay, I'll run it in synthesis so you can see it there, and there we are. Here we go. The only difference is this goes from 400 to 200, the other one went from 400 to zero. Okay, so that should get you, that should get you thinking. It's the same rate of decay. It looks like it, but it's like, it's a close cousin, but it's not exactly it, okay? Uh, a close cousin of it, but it's not precisely uh, precisely the same. It's like a sister of it, right? Um, okay, so uh, this is its dynamics and looks very similar to the dynamics above, right? There we go. There we go. If I didn't give you time to look at the axes, you, you might think those are exactly the same graph, right? Look at that. Which one is which? If I covered up the axis, you couldn't tell me, right? Okay. Um, Okay, let's look at its portrait in, in state space, phase space, um, such as it is, even though it only has one variable. Well, its portrait in phase space looks also very similar to the above. Um, it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's just got these different axes and therefore the particulars. But there is something that's a little bit interesting here. Um, uh, of course, it's displaced, right? Instead of being going to zero, it's going to 200. And you'll notice it highlights the fact that underneath we have things approaching from below. Above, we have things approaching from above. And we see the same thing here. But above, in this case, these were associated with values of X that are what? Like, can I get down here? If, if X is bacteria and X is the 
so, uh, the population size for bacteria. Can I get down to these values? Why? These are values of x that are begins with n. Negative. <laughs> negative values of x. Okay. Um, and I'm not talking gram-negative bacteria or something like that, right? Um, Because you're not simulating it um, within ranges where the numerical integration is is accurate. Because it, it mathematically it can't go down, and so what must be happening is the rate of change of alpha uh, is so high that uh, at the level of integration it's it's going negative. Either that, or there's something that begins with a b, it ends with a g, and it has a u in it. <laughs> Uh, um, okay, um, so, so ladies and gentlemen, we see these are close cousins of each other, and I want to just walk through why they're close cousins of each other. And in fact, they're really such close cousins, one can be transformed to the other in a purely linear way. Okay? Okay, so here we have, I'm going to put this on the board because I, I think it will sink in more. Okay? So, um, First, we add dx dt. This was our system one, right? Maybe I'll, yeah, sure. Um, dx, uh, dx dt equals minus 0.5x, right? Right? Maybe, maybe, forgive me, I'll just write this as x minus x over 2. Just, I'm, I'm taking advantage of the liberties of the board. Is that okay? Okay, that's, that's one system that we were talking about. Right? Um, and, you know, maybe to avoid um, confusion here, but to, to keep it according to the same notation, I'm just going to call it, uh, no, I'll call it A, okay? DA, uh, DA DT, A dot equals minus A over 2. I'm just going to use a different name, right? Just a label. It, 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 it's, but I don't want you to get confused about something. Okay. So that was the so-called homogeneous system, homogeneous or homogeneous, because um, there's, there was, that was the very first system we looked at, right? There was no constant term on the right, or so-called forcing function on the right. I would call it an engineering, OK? OK, now this other system looked instead like uh, the following. With this other system, we had 100 coming in and the same basic uh, logic associated with the outflow, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had with this other system, we had x dot equals, and it's minus x over two, just like this system on the right. But what do we have here? We had 100, okay? That, that's, here, go, go look at this. Go look at this. This is, here we go. Um, immigration, see 100, right? Or if we go up here, we'll see that it's um, that it's 100, right? Okay, okay. Um, okay, now, so this is this is what we got, and I want to ask: Is that system linear? Can you can you tell me? Is that system as stated linear? So if we represent this. As on the right hand side of f of x, is that system linear? No. And why not? Well, let's 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 put it through its paces. Let's evaluate it, right? Let's evaluate it for linearity. There's um, there's some important criteria here for linearity. It has to pass two linearity tests, right? For this to be linear, right? It has to pass two linearity tests. So tell me what those tests are. Uh, yeah, f of a plus b is needs to be what? Yeah, f of a plus f of b. Okay, let's let's whoa. All right. Um. So can you tell me is that is that true? Okay, so let's let plug it in. Right. If this is f of x, f of a plus b is we plug in for x we plug in what? A plus b. Right. So f of a plus b for our system, f of a plus b for us, um, f of a plus b equals what? 
100 minus what? A plus B over 2. Are we okay with that? It's a 2. It's not a... I don't know what it looks like. Okay. Are we okay with that? Um, okay. Um, and we could write this out. Um, just dividing things through. This is 100 minus A over 2, right? Minus B over 2, right? Okay, are we okay with that? Okay, so that's this. So we've evaluated that side, the left-hand side. If we're evaluating f of, whether f of A plus B equals f of A plus f of B, we've, we've determined what the left-hand side of this is for our evaluation. And now, what's f of A? What's f of A? If we plug in A for this, for f of x here, if this is f of x, this thing here is f of x, what is, what is f of A? It's 100 minus what? A over 2, right? And what's f of B? 100 minus B over 2. And if we sum them up, f of A plus f of B equals what? What do we get? If we sum them up. 200 minus A over 2 minus B over 2. Is that the same as 100 minus A over 2? No. No. It's, it ain't the same. Right? This is not equal to that. Okay, let's, let's, how about the other test? How about the other test? Um, so this is test one. Failed, right? Failed test one. Okay? Um, how about test two? What does test two stipulate? Whether it's linear. F of alpha x needs to equal alpha times f of x, right? Okay, so now let's plug in something a little bit prescient. What can we make alpha? I, I, I actually used this tr kind of trick before. I chose alpha to bring out a certain fact. Let's choose, this has to be true for all alpha. So let's, let's uh, choose alpha equals, yeah, okay, that's not a, not a terrible idea, but I'm gonna, I have an even simpler one. Alpha equals zero. Alpha equals zero, right? Choose alpha alpha equals zero. Is this true for alpha equals zero? This has to be true for all alpha. Let's choose alpha equals zero, right? So f of alpha times x, which equals f of zero, has to equal alpha times f of x, whatever f of x is. And what is that? Uh, alpha is zero, so it has to equal zero. Is, is alpha, is, or sorry, is f of zero in this case zero? Is f of zero equals zero? No, no, f of zero equals what? You plug in zero to f of x, you get what? 100 minus zero, or if I really want to be pedantic, 100 minus zero over two, which is equal to 100, and that is not equal to zero. Most oh, certainly, right? So this is nominally it's nonlinear. We could say it's nonlinear. Nonlinear. Um, but it's a close cousin of a linear form. Okay? Um, and so it's nonlinear, but we're gonna transform it into a linear form. Okay? So what we're going to do, so this is nonlinear, and I'll I'll erase this. So it fails or test for linearity, okay? It's not linear. It needs to fail only one test. It needs to only fail one, but I did two just to drive home the if, point. If it fails one, will it always fail the other? Good question. Um, I, I believe there's a way to specify it with only one condition that generalizes this. If it fails one of those tests, um, Yeah, I, I think uh, I think we could specify it purely with the a plus b, and we wouldn't have to specify it with the alpha one. I think the alpha one falls out of that, but not vice versa. But uh, don't quote me on that. I it's, just, to, it's just simpler. Depending on the case. Yeah. One way 
Right. Right. I, I, I'd say that's that's true. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to think about that a little bit. I think you could prove it purely from the A plus B case because, well, you could, it follows through from, from, from X, okay? Um, but, yeah, I want to think. Okay. So, so let's, let's consider this now. Okay, so we have this function. It's x dot equals minus 100 minus alpha over 2, or sorry, uh, minus x over 2. So x dot equals 100 minus x over 2. This, is, this 100 is the immigration, right? And the x over 2 is the outflow, right? Of bacteria, yeah. Okay, so we're going, to, I, I will argue that we could transform this into this thing here in a purely linear way, which means that by extension, we can view this in the linear family because it's a close cousin and it's so trivial to transform. We, we basically say, yeah, we can handle that. It just, it, it, it can be represented in a purely linear way, okay? So uh, all we have to do here is a simple trick, okay? Um, and the basic deal is to choose a, a way of describing this system which eliminates this constant term. And it's going to seem like a cheap trick here, but in fact it's, um, it's a very general trick, as we'll see, for, for arbitrary size systems that we could transform them in this way. And it means basically we don't have to worry about inhomogeneity. Okay, we're going to choose cleverly another way to describe that system, another way to label it. And the logic of this is shown right here, okay? Um, so the basic, but I wanna help you understand why I'm following this logic. So the idea is, look, crudely, we want to represent this system in a way that this 100 goes away, okay? So, we want to represent something where x over 2 is going to be this thing involving this other variable with a term that ends up canceling out the 100. Okay? So we want something where x over 2 involves some function of, so choose a y, choose variable y defined such that such that x over 2 is going to be some function of y, some function purely involving y. Maybe it'll be y, y over 2 for, for simplicity. Um, minus, guess what? Could it just be 200 minus So, sorry, plus 100. Sorry? Could it be 200 minus? Yeah, yeah, well, we're, we're, we're going to get to that. Exactly, exactly, Alex. You're thinking the right way. So this is going to be y over 2 plus 100. We're going to make x almost the same as y, but or y almost the same as x, but it's going to be with a term here. And, and why is that? It's because when we plug in for that, why do I put 100 here? Because it's going to cancel out that 100. So when we... When you stick this in, it's, gonna, it's going to cancel out this 100. And, let, okay, so if, if follow me through. And, and that's what's written down here in the sheet if you want to look at it, okay? So let's, let's just follow this through. So why, what is, so if, if we want this to be true, we sort of, we, we cleverly sort of trick the situation so we cancel out that thing, then then um, let's let's go figure out um, how this how this follows through. Okay, if this is the case, then y equals just just following through the algebra here, right? What what is y equal? So if this is if if, if x over two equals y over two plus one hundred, what what is y as a function of x? Yeah. So if we multiply both sides by two we get x equals y plus 200, right? And then we, we just subtract the 200 from the left-hand side and we flip the side, so it's y equals x minus 200, right? Is that, is that okay? Okay, um, and equally much so, x equals what? y 
plus 200. Okay, okay. Now, you may be wondering where this is going. Okay, yeah, so you chose this. Why am I giving that? Okay, so let's, let's write the equation in terms of y. What is x dot? x dot equals what? It's dx dt, right? And what is that in terms of y? Well, it's, it's, it's d y plus 200 dt, right? Yeah? This is not a t, this is a y plus 200 divided by, or, or, you know, dt. And what is that? What is dy plus 200 dt? It's equal to dy dt. Or, or I'll just write it as y dot, right? y dot equals, and what's on the right-hand side? 100 minus x, but substituting in the definition for x, this equals what? The definition for x in terms of, of y plus 200. This is what? 100, ooh. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. This should be what? Where, where, where did I make a mistake? This is over 2. Over 2. That's critical. Or else we'd be in bad shape. We'd go, like, we'd have a deficit. It would be horrible. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, bad things would happen. Okay. So, so this is 100 minus what? X over 2, right? What is X over 2? y plus 200 over 2, right? And I mean, Alex saw this much earlier, but, but he, his mind left ahead, as it often does. And, and I'm just following this through in a very simple way. This is 100 minus y over 2 minus 100, right? And this cancels out for that. And what do we have on the left-hand side? Minus y over 2. Right, yeah, minus y over 2. Okay? Um, so what this is telling us is this, this, this system can be instead represented using just different names for things as min y dot equals minus y over 2, which is what? A what system? A linear system. Does this satisfy the criteria for linearity? You bet it does. It, it most certainly does, okay? Um, and all we did is kind of use different names for things. We used a name, instead of talking about x, we talked about x, uh, we talked about y, where y is the same thing as x, it's just offset by 200, right? We just described the system in different words using a variable that's kind of slightly different, just by in this case a constant, and we end up we end up getting something that's purely linear. And in fact, do you recognize this system? It's the same as the original system we work with. It's the same darn system. It has the same characteristic dynamics and everything. We just are describing it in a different way. With we choose our variables to by which we choose to describe it differently, right? And so that's the transformation that's written there. And if you go into the Maple Notebook, you can follow through the ideas, but I've, I've laid them out there, right? Um, okay. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, so now this system, this transform system, is written just like that, but instead of starting at 200, uh, it needs to start at what? Instead of starting at x equals 200, it starts at y equals what? Sorry, sorry. instead of starting at x equals 400, it starts at y equals 200, because y is defined as x minus 200, right? But it decays in exactly the same way. Its dynamics are the same. And, um, and uh, here's the, the transform system. And, that should look identical uh, in, its, um, in terms of when we describe it in terms of y to the original system. Hmm? Because this is the same, same thing. When we describe it in terms of y, it's, it's the same system. Okay, okay. So, so what I'm trying to say is um, it's actually not a barrier that you have flows in or flows out that are given by constants uh, because we just choose to describe them linearly, 
We, we choose our ways of describing them. We choose the variables we use to describe them in a way that, that renders them linear, okay? And, and this is useful. Um, and uh, while they're nominally nonlinear when describing it a certain way, when we choose the right, when we describe it using the right variables, we see that they're linear. Now, this reflects, you may wonder why I went through this exercise. Well, one thing is because I don't want you to think that it's somehow a big barrier that things are inhomogeneous. But another reason is this relates to another feature of linear systems. And in fact, another feature of linearized systems, that by choosing our way of describing the system, we can get great insight, okay? And we can see that we can reason about it easily. And where we're going to see this again is in just this moment, um, in a few minutes, we're gonna describe a system that's that involve two state variables, x and y, okay? Um, here, um, it's a second order delay system. And I call it in our, in our, um, in our uh, maple sheet, I call it example zero C. So I'm gonna load this in, here we go. Um, so here's zero C, there we go. So these are two first order delays that are uncoupled right now. Why do I say uncoupled? They're not connected. Y doesn't depend on X. The, the value of the change in Y doesn't depend on the change in X, and the change in X doesn't depend on the change in Y. They're decoupled. One exists as a, can exist as a solitude for the other. You don't have to know about the value of X to compute how Y changes, nor the other. They can be simulated independently of each other and we can understand the behavior for both. So I'm describing it in different ways. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Pretty soon, we'll see how we can characterize any linear system in a decoupled way. By choosing, by choosing the variables by which we describe it. How to describe it will allow it to be characterized in an uncoupled way. In other words, this may look strangely simplistic to you, but we'll see in just a few minutes that if you have another linear system where these do nominally depend on each other, there's a way to describe it so that they don't depend on one another. But how we describe the system so its different components don't depend on another will, um, will, will take a little bit of thinking, okay? Um, it, 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 the natural way to describe it is, is in terms of its, in terms of linear combinations of its state variables that are, that, and we can know what the right linear combinations are to describe it, to describe it in a totally decoupled way if we look at its eigenvectors. Its eigenvectors will tell us how to take a a nominally coupled linear system and describe it instead in a way it's totally decoupled. That one thing is independent of the others, they're solitudes, we can simulate them separately, etc. That's the nature of linear system. We can take them apart into pieces and reason only about the pieces and thereby understand the whole. Okay? So here's a system that is obviously decoupled. We're gonna run it here in synthesis, okay? There we go. Oh, well, <laughs> there we didn't go. Um, there we go, okay. So here we have a mean time in X of one and a mean time in Y of two, okay? Are we okay with that? Mean time in X, mean time in Y. And X is starting at, what is X starting at? X is starting at 400. And y is starting at, by the way, this is not the same y we use there. Um, it's a different y, 100, okay? Uh, the mean time in y is two, the mean time in x is one. And there we can go see this system right here. Can you see this? There it is. 400 and, and 100, one decays from 400, one decays from 100, okay? Um, so, this is the dynamics over time if we view them together. Um, now, the Jacobian here, the, 
the Jacobian here is also completely straightforward. So what we have is um, uh, for the, we're taking the Jacobian of a matrix, uh, which uh, has just, um, so the, the Jacobian of this system, the system involves for the first element of the system, dx dt equals minus x, that's the minus x here. And the second element of the system as dy dt equals minus 0.5y, so it's minus 0.5y. And that's the Jacobian right here. What's, what's this element of the Jacobian in the upper left? Yeah, it's the partial, it's, so the first whole row is considering how does the rate of change of x, these successive elements of, of dx dt, how do they change with successive state variables, right? So it, the whole first row relates to this minus one times x of t. The, the element over here on the left-hand side of the upper row is the derivative of minus, it's partial minus one times x of t, partial what? x. This next one is minus partial f sub x, partial y, right? Do you remember? Do you remember that? This, this is this Jacobian back, uh, back here, remember this? Um, um, Okay, um, do, 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 do. Um, so this is, right, partial f, f sub x is just the part of the, the, the function of, of the state that relates to, that dictates the rate of change of variable x, right? Um, the rate of change of, of the x component of, of s. Remember, I had it back, um, back uh, here, right? Mm -hmm. So f sub x of s all relates to this, this guy here, right? That's, that's f sub uh, x of, 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 of s uh, all relates to this equation, minus one times x of t. And we're taking as derivative, partial derivative with respect to x and respect to y. And we get minus one and zero. And then for the second row, it's all with respect to these components here, dy dt equals some f sub y of the whole state, which in this case depends only on y, right? That, that, that component only depends on y, right? Okay, so this is our Jacobian, and it's already diagonal, note. And if we take its eigenvalues, we get minus one and 0.5. This is, these are the kind of natural natural re decay rates or natural change rates of the system as a whole. And in this case, they're just given by, because it's already a decoupled system, they're just given by the decay rates of each of these components. Hey, get, get over here. Um, okay, ah, sorry. Um, uh, they're just given by the decay rates of each of these components. There's minus one and minus 0.5 because it's it's a mean time. It's divided by that, right? And so it's multiplied by minus 0.5. Um, uh, the eigen, and we'll we'll come to that diagonalization later. Now here's the phase space portrait of this, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, that, what are the dimensions of this phase space? Now we have two dimensions. We have two dimensions, ladies and gentlemen. What are those two dimensions? X and Y. Right? And so a given point here in phase space means right now, say we have 400 x's and 100 y's. And this trajectory in state space, you notice it's following these arrows, okay? The arrows are sort of pointing in the direction of the trajectory. The arrows are indicating at a given point in the phase space how x is changing and y is changing, okay? So this is it's saying, X is going down uh, quite quickly compared to Y, which is only going down slightly compared to it. And so this trajectory starts off kind of having a, a, a shallow slope. It, it doesn't change in the Y direction that quickly. No, well, the direction of the arrows are actually defined by um, the uh, and I'll, I'll see if I can uh, quickly illustrate it here. The direction of the arrows in the state space is saying how fast is X changing, Y changing, Z changing. 
it's actually purely defined by f, f sub s. It's just the, the rate of change of x right now, rate of change of y, rate of change in z, and how um, in the relative values. So it's essentially taking the, I'd have to think about it, but it's like the arc tangent. It's basically pointing in the direction of the, uh, the gradient of the, the rate of change. So like if dx dt is very fast and dy dt is very slow, you get, um, you get this very sort of shallow change. Um, so the arrow is kind of pointing in uh, this, uh, the, the according parallel to that state vector of dx dt, dy dt, dz dt. Um, if y were changing as quickly as x, the arrow would be pointing in a minus 45 degree line. It would be pointing down sort of, you know, such that uh, the, the change in x and the change in y are, are the same. Does that make sense? It's kind of indicating how fast it's changing in relative terms. But importantly, these arrows, I, I said relative terms, because these arrows aren't larger if it's changing uh, if, if, it's, uh, if it's changing um, faster. So if, if, for example, an arrow at a point where it's, you know, minus, um, so x is changing, the rate of change of x is minus 1, and the rate of change of y is minus 1. So dx dt equals minus 1, dy dt equals minus 1. That arrow will be the same length as um, if it were, both were minus 2. It's, it's only the relative uh, speed, so it's it's pointing. Uh, that's just a diagrammatic convention here they've used. They're not making them longer or shorter depending how fast it is. It's just how quickly one is changing relative to the other. So it's like basically to see that like the direction is telling you that which component is dominating. That's right. That's right. So like here, x is pulling down much more quickly than y, yeah. um, and if it were a hundred times the rate of change for both, it would still point in that same direction. Sorry, and what do you mean in terms of the length of the arrow? Oh, but by the length, I mean the, the magnitude of the change. I'm talking like if it's, again, minus both dx dt equals minus 1, dy dt equals minus 1, if you consider the arrow for that, mm -hmm. versus dx dt equals minus 10 and dy dt equals minus 10, the arrows would look identical okay. because they're they're... They're just, uh, they don't scale it according to the magnitude. Yes, Alex? Are both systems that are decoupled, are they both plotted there? Yes, yes. Are they overlapping? Uh, no, no, so this is the state with respect to Y, so this is the state um, with respect to the value of, of, of um, sorry, uh, of, of Y, and this oh. is the state with respect to the value of X. So a given point here says x has a certain value and y has a certain value. Yeah. And then it's, it's changing, right? And what you see it going in for here is it's being sucked into this point. So what is this telling you is happening? Well, actually, it doesn't tell you which, is it going this way or that way <laughs> uh, directly, the, the blue line. But you can tell by the flow arrows, the flow arrows it's going this way. Um, so what's happening here? Well x is decaying, right? And y is decaying. Which is decaying faster? Yeah. Um, x is decaying faster. That's why the arrows are pointing mostly in the x direction. And, um, and you know, if we consider x going from 400 to 200, that's halving its size of the state vector in x. But it's only decreasing the size of the state vector in y by about um, one quarter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so x is decaying faster than y, and it's decaying, in, and both are headed towards what? x and y equals zero. Yeah. And so that's what, that's what um, uh, this, this goes to. They go to x, x and y both, both be zero, OK? Um, OK, so that's. Um, um, that's that. Uh, that's that system. And here, as I've said, they're decoupled. They're, so they're obviously decoupled. Now, what I'm going to give you a glimpse of now, and then we'll stop, is a coupled system. So this is called 1A. If anyone wants to try to load it in, I will load these all onto the site. So here's 1A. 
Um, and the distinguishing feature here is that we have a, a system that's nominally coupled, right? Um, this is what we call a second order delay. So you have X going into Y, and so this might be birth to bacteria, aging, and death, right? Um, this is a system that is, is a nominally coupled system um, because the value, the rate of change of X depends on Y. Um, so, so here, most obviously, the rate of change of Y depends on X, right? If X ha has zero components in it, Y won't be changing quickly. If Y has many components, Y will be, if as many things in it, Y will be changing quickly. So Y depends on X in an obvious way, right? And if you go look, uh, but not necessarily vice versa, X doesn't depend on Y, right? So let's go look at a description of that system. X doesn't depend on Y, dx dt equals minus X. Um, but dy dt depends on X and Y, right? dy dt depends on X and Y, because dy dt is, includes outflow, which depends only on Y, and inflow, which depends on X, right? But X doesn't depend on Y, and, and that's why this is a minus X. Okay, so it looks, it looks very coupled, and, and it is nominally coupled. But we describe it, and here's its behavior over time. So um, X is decaying down. Y goes up. Y starts at zero. X starts at 400. As X goes down, Y goes up. Why does it go up? Forget the pun. Why does Y rise? Yeah, the the end. So y starts zero, x flows into y, and therefore it's it's going to rise. Yeah? Here's the Jacobian. And notice the Jacobian is just the description of this. It's uh, um, uh, it's it's or sorry, we're taking the Jacobian of this matrix. So this is sort of characterizing how does um, uh, how does uh, the, what is the Jacobian of this? This is the Jacobian minus. One zero, so uh, partial f uh, sub x, partial x is minus one. That that came from the minus x, and partial f sub x minus, uh, sorry, partial f sub x, partial y is what? Zero. And partial f sub y, partial x is one. That's from this x of t, and partial f sub y. Minus uh, partial y is just this minus 0.5, right? Okay, so we're doing great here. Um, that's our Jacobian, um, and this is what it looks like state space wise. We have we have sort of a decay of x over time, but then uh, y is actually rising and then coming down. So we start here. It's all x's, ladies and gentlemen, and no y's, and then y rises. And but while X is still decaying, that's what we saw above, right? That's what we saw here. X is still decaying, Y rises, and, and then, but both end up approaching here. But the thing that's most interesting here, ladies and gentlemen, is that we can transform this to be represented as a system um, that is, is purely independent. And we will talk more about this next time. But fundamentally, by describing this with the right variables, by, by, by choosing our variables carefully by which to describe this, or as it were, our language to describe this, by choosing the natural variables of the system, we're going to be able to describe this as two decoupled, decoupled, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, first order delays, okay? Um, we're gonna be able to describe it using a system where we have um, two, two uh, decoupled components um, by just choosing the variables we have as combinations of X and Y cleverly, okay? Um, and this, uh, the fact that we can take it and describe in this way is a reflection of the fact that eigenvectors are kind of the natural ways to describe this system. 
And by describing in that way, we can describe it independently in terms of the two, um, the two variables we choose. But those two variables will be combinations of x and y, not x and y. They will be linear combinations of them. And those linear combinations are given by these eigenvectors. One of them will actually be x, OK? Um, and uh, another will actually be, um, uh, be a, com a, a linear combination of them, OK? So um, uh, we will uh, see, these, um, see these characterized uh, within our, our next lecture. So um, we will see that the, the resulting system has eigenvalues. Um, the transformed system has the eigen, same eigenvalues as the original system. It is the original system. We're just using different languages to describe it, much as this system here involving y is the same system as uh, this system up here involving x. We've just chosen a different way of describing it. We've chosen our our, our variables um, um, yeah, differently. Okay, so uh, we'll see how this um, how this uh, can be used to, to describe the system in terms of x, terms of y. Recognizing one of them, I said it's x. It's actually going to be I think y, and then the other one will be in terms of a combination of x and y. By choosing that, we'll decouple the system, and uh, we can understand the whole by understanding each piece and summing them up. So uh, we will see this next time, and uh, we'll see uh, how that refactored system um, can be identified through these eigenvalues and eigenvectors, um, et cetera. And then we'll go on to um, uh, nonlinear systems shortly. Okay? Um, I'm going to assign you a little exercise getting you to use Maple. So I'd suggest that you try to see if you can use Maple. I believe it's installed. I think I checked earlier on this. I want to double check that it's installed on the lab computers here, or you can download it. Um, and I'm going to have you reason through what these graphs look like for certain systems and go through this process of plotting out their time behavior and their state space behavior. Um, uh, and uh, we'll use that to build intuitions that will then be very helpful when we go on to the case of nonlinear systems, where the behaviors can be more, more complex, but where we um, will end up, having, uh, end up having the ability to describe them around fixed points using, uh, linear, using the concepts we've built up for linear systems. Okay, So that's all for today. And oh, a very important point. Um,